name is Carlos Leon. I'm 35 years old. I'm a software developer from Colombia. And I'm currently working for Container Solutions as a software engineer for infrastructure for distributed computing, computing uh, big data analysis. Docker, yeah. So a little, bit, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Terraform basically is this uh, command line tool developed by HashiCorp on which you, with some DSL, some configuration file, you define how you want your infrastructure to be. So you okay, want to have 10 servers with these DNS records and these mail whatever and blah, blah, blah. And then it will bring it from the nothing, from the ground, all the way to the top. So if you can imagine having, for example, a cluster of Amazon instances, EC2 instances with ELB and S3 and security groups and all this kind of crap, you don't have to create your cloud formation configuration Bible. <coughs> Instead, you have a very concise snippet of code on which you can define your infrastructure and then Terraform will take care of it. <coughs> the advantage of having your infrastructure as code is that you can keep track using your favorite source control management tool. For some people's Git, for the mortals, is Maven or whatever, whatever it is that all people use. Um, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you are young in your heart if you use Git. Um, wait, one second. Maven, Maven, Maven is not, a, it's not an SVM. What is the name of the Mercury? Sorry, Mercury is what I meant. Anyway, whatever. It's too long. Because wait. Execution plans is another feature of Terraform. Basically, Terraform has the uh, has the uh, the ability to say, okay, give me your configuration. What is it that you want? And you say, well, we have here this infrastructure, and then Terraform you say, well, what do you think that you can do with this Terraform? And then Terraform is like, yeah, I think that what I need to do is to create this thing, to modify these records, and to destroy these machines. And it can do that because it has something called a resource graph. Basically, Terraform. Um, in memory during runtime, reads your file and reads all and any any. Let me let me think if I can get this straight for you guys. Uh, Terraform reads your configuration file. It understands what you have in there and it identifies different resources or units, whatever you want to call them, and then it says, Ah, oh, okay, so I need to like create these and modify these and whatever, and then it creates all the resource graph, all, all, all your infrastructure as a graph. And then thanks to that, it can, uh, it can maximize the utilization of your resources to run everything in parallel. So if we go to the basics of what Terraform does, is for Terraform to, to work whatever, whatsoever, you need to specify only a config file. So with uh, Terraform, as, as I was telling you, uh, you say, okay, Terraform, here is how I want my infrastructure to look like, and you just give it to Terraform. And Terraform is like, well, well okay, let me just parse it, and maybe we can do something about it. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter. Man. This is what the configuration file kind of looks like. Uh, you have, um, this is a specific DSL that Terraform has. And yeah, this is a code block, for example, to configure how you're going to talk to Docker. This is a Terraform provider that is built in that comes out of the box when you install Terraform. And you can talk to Docker to, for example, pull images from the hub and control the workflow at the, the life cycle of a container. Stop it, stop it, change its name, link it to whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so here we have it. We have a Docker image, which we arbitrarily call Ubuntu, and we give it a name. It can, it, 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 this is going to be the name from the Docker Hub. This name can be whatever. You can just call it Bucket Book if you want. It doesn't matter. It, this is what really matters. But you can figure that out from the documentation and whatnot. What I want to show you guys is that later here, we create the actual container. We say, okay, I want a Docker container, which is named Foo. And then the image is this, and then the name is whatever. This is also arbitrary. This value and this value don't, doesn't have to be related to the other one. Um, then we have a plan. This TF is just an alias that we created for Terraform. So every, anytime that you see on my slide that it says TF, 
be using alias and Terraform. So I tell uh, Terraform, hey, yo, give me a plan. So the plan is find any configuration file that I have in my DNF directory and tell me what you think. Tell me what is your plan? What are you planning to do with my infrastructure? And so Terraform says, okay, well, um, this is the execution plan that I have created for you. I'm going to create a Docker container and a Docker image. The Docker image is uh, called Ubuntu, and the name is this. And also, after, also I'm going to create a Docker container called Foo, which is called Docker Foo. And the image is this Docker image Ubuntu layer. So we're going to come back to this uh, relationship between resources in a short bit. Then, I was smart here to run this demo in my own computer in my own time so that the demo gods don't fuck me up during stage time. <laughs> so, Terraform apply. <laughs> what Terraform apply is going to do is, you're going to take my infrastructure, uh, my config.tf file, which is my infrastructure description, it's going to generate a plan, and then it's going to run it. It's going to say, okay, let's do it, we'll focus. I'm going to take my Docker image, Ubuntu, I'm going to create it, and then I'm going to take the Docker container, I'm going to create it. By the end, if everything went all right, we like it when everything went all right and everything is green. He says, okay, apply complete, I added two resources, no change and no destroy. And then, this is going to be added to a database file. This database file is called the TF state file, and this is very important, and I'm going to show you guys why. We do a Docker show. It shows me what is the current status of my infrastructure as of the local database file. The cool thing is that I can get an idea of what's going on in my setup, which let's call it staging or production. So I know that in production right now I have a Docker container and a Docker image of whatever ID, and the hash of whatever, the gateway IP and whatnot, the ports, whatever. The thing is, if something changes in production because somebody, our new developer who is always super bright, the junior developer, that we're like, okay, this is how you need to do things, and then they're like, oh, okay, cool, let's just change things in production because fuck it, YOLO and Chuck Norris and whatever. So they go and they change something, and then you do Terraform show, and what you're going to see is the Terraform is like, hmm, wait a second, I just went to production and I checked things, and things just don't don't seem to be as, as of the configuration that you told me first. So Terraform is going to compare your config file, the one that you have defined in your database, it's going to go, it's going to, go to production, check what is the current state. It says, hmm, actually for, say, for this machine you have said that it had 20 gigabytes of uh, disk space, but now it has 61. And so, because you have this under your source control management system, then you can tell who did what and how. Well, I mean, locally, if it is in production, then you need to check your logs and whatever and start pointing at people and firing. <laughs> this is what the, what the Terraform TF state file looked like. This is a JSON file. Um, and here you have all the description of your infrastructure as per the last run that you did against Terraform. You did Terraform apply and you wanted to create all the Docker containers and all that. You came here after it finished and it updated this database. The cool thing about this is that because it is a JSON file, we like JSON, we don't like SML because it's too old. We like the like, new cutting edge technology because it's their new buzzwords and blah blah blah. But jokes aside, if you have an easy to read Terraform file, if you have an easy to read JSON file that you can process with your programming language, then you can do whatever, whatever. So what, by, by this I mean that you can use this file, interpret it in your favorite programming language, and you can show states of your, of your um, infrastructure. You can, do, you can act on the state of your infrastructure. Uh, is it clear so far? Is, if anybody has any questions during, during my talk, you can just raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a microphone. Uh, I have one question. Yes, the gentleman back there who doesn't know Terraform. Yes, I don't know Terraform. Um, what happens if, for example, I have a Docker cluster? So, is, sorry, can you come again? If I have a Docker cluster, yes. um, an IP changes because a host fell over, how Terraform reacts to that one? 
right? So you mean which which IP of your of your so of your Docker daemon? Yeah, so state of production of container, which let's say I deployed with uh, Terraform, right? Changes because of host failover. Okay. What how Terraform reacts on that one? It cannot because Terraform is a command that you run. It's not like a daemon that is running in background or or like anything like that. You have to manually run your Terraform. And when you do Terraform status or Terraform show to see what is the current status, it will try to talk to your to your cluster, but it will not be able to because your IP change changed. So you will have to update the, the IP to the latest in your configuration file here, where you say you configure here your Docker provider, and you say what is the host. You can also configure where the certs and all that. And if then it's not running in one hundred twenty seven zero zero one, and so I. Dude, sorry, I tried but I, I, I could not, I couldn't find it. Thank you though, thanks for that, appreciate it. Um, now, the resource graph, is this thing that we were talking about that Terraform, when you do apply and you have all these different resources, it will in-memory build a graph saying which resources need to be created, updated, or deleted, and it, and it will try to perform as parallel as possible to be as efficient as it can be. It's a pretty neat feature of Terraform because if you have, say, 100, 100 servers that you want to spin up as soon as possible, you don't have to create one by one and just spin as many as many threads, as, as many code routines as you can, and we're trying to do everything concurrently. We like that because it's fast and all because it's fast work. Now, let's take a little bit more uh, complex example, and for me, this is where the juice of Terraform is. Uh, here we have uh, defined three different resources. Heroku app, a DNS simple record, and the Heroku domain. No matter what the configuration is, the important thing is um, uh, these values right here, the name here, 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 and here. So what we're saying here is we are interconnecting or we are relating a resource to the other one. And Terraform is pretty smart because it will not create this DNS info record if this Heroku app has not been created yet. And so then you can have defined your whole infrastructure in one configuration file, and as you can see, it's pretty simple. Okay, your mileage may vary because your configuration will probably not be anything like this. It's going to be a way much production ready, robust configuration, but still. You don't need to be going back and forth between different tools and different configuration files to define your infrastructure as how it's going to be looking like. So, as we can see here, <coughs> Terraform, what it's going to do is to create this Heroku app, then it's going to create this DNS symbol record, and it's going to yield the name of this Heroku app, which is here. So, it's, so this name in the end is going to be Neocat. Same for here. It's going to fetch the Heroku hostname. And here is going to fetch values from both the Heroku app, which is the first one, and from the DNS simple record, which is the second resource. So Terraform can take care of that for you um, concurrently without too much hassle in your code or anything like that. This is the this is the plan. We can see it all, we can we can see a little more explicit here. So we see here that it's going to create a DNS simple record, and we see here that the value is, is yielded from here, and this is also computed, and this and this and that, and you're right, it works. But as uh, we were, as we were uh, talking earlier, what if you have changes in your infrastructure? What if, because reasons, you had to go to production because one of the servers was running low memory and you had to, I don't know, whatever. You did it the wrong way, you did it the dirty way, you were tired, it was Saturday night, and you got the, what's it called again, the pager duty notification. You know, like, well, like how sleep, and you just added more memory, you went to sleep again. So next time that you run Terraform, Terraform will notice about that change. It will notice, you will just say Terraform show, and you say, hey, here in your local configuration, you see that, you say that it's supposed to be a gigabyte instance, but now it's got eight. So that's different. And I don't know, it might be good for you, you might care, you might not care, it's up to you. But Terraform offers you that option. Oh, and by default, what it's going to do, if the, if the provider has been properly implemented, it will take that new information and reflect it in your Terraform TF state file, which is your local database. 
Now, let's, uh, let's talk very shortly about modules. If you come up with a nifty configuration for Terraform, say that you, you put a little thought on this and you say, okay, if this variable, if this can be extracted from a variable and this and this and this and this and that, then people can have a standard AWS setup with Terraform. So then if I want to run tomorrow a, a small Amazon cluster, and I, I don't want to write it from the scratch. I just go here, and copy paste, and then I put all my variables in there. I just fill it up, and then boom, I have my Amazon EC2 cluster or whatever. This uh, maybe this example is not very attractive for you guys, but for example, at Container Solutions, my colleague Thais came up with the idea of setting up a Mesos cluster in the Google Compute Engine, and we created well, he created a module for that. So if you want to run your own Mesos cluster in Google Compute Engine and you don't want to worry about configuring it at all, then you just, just clone the module, run it, and that's it. Put up your credentials and have it. Um, this is very neat if you, want to, if you want to have, for example, multiple teams working with different environments, but the setup is the same, so different staging instances, then you just share a module. Just share it, hey, I want to, I want to have another staging, yeah, sure, bro, just copy this, clone it, run it. Enjoy and forget about it. Third party providers. So this is the these are the providers that you can as of today talk with Terraform to provision your stuff. So for example, if you want to have some Amazon uh, AWS instances, EC2, S3, Relative 53 records, and whatever, you can use Terraform. You use a small configuration file, run it, done. So the major providers are here, as you can see, OpenStack, Compute Instances, Organic Services, Little Balancers, Docker, Images, and Containers, we saw that example, Google Cloud, Compute Instances, blah, 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 blah. And also you can develop yours. If you have your own, uh, what's it? If you have your own uh, private infrastructure, and it happens that it has an API, and you want to talk to that so that you don't have to manually Generate, for example, I see that people from their glass have their own complex case of uh, breaking up servers and whatnot. Uh, I don't know what is currently their approach for solving that provisioning a server from the ground up, breaking it up, but they could, in theory, develop a Terraform provider that could talk to those servers and bring them up all the way from the ground up. As we have done before, we have a, we have a, we have a very specific use case for one of our customers who has a big cloud platform and they wanted to automate bringing the servers all the way from the ground up. Like bare metal, like they have these spiritual servers that have nothing, they know nothing about the world, and they would terraform a couple of uh, configuration files which are pretty neat. Right? And then they have their own cluster. Something that took weeks, we reduced to a couple of 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, a thing about building your own providers is that the documentation is rather, what is the word for that? Very sparse. Sparse, but it's, it's not the best. It is, it is a work in progress because, as you have noticed, uh, Terraform has not yet been released, it has not yet been bumped to 1.0. It is now 6.069, is the last version they released this week. Uh, it is under heavy development, but the API is very, very stable. So far, we haven't had any trouble developing our pro our plugins or our providers and having like buffers incompatibilities or anything like that. So, in that sense, HashiCorp is a very mindful company when they are developing their tools. That's something that we really like. I personally like. Oh. <laughs> Yes, you had a question. Sorry, I totally forgot about chat. No problem. Thanks. Uh, I saw a Terraform provider in Terraform. Now, I looked at this today, and it seems like you can take Terraform resources from other TF files and include them in, so you can kind of create dependencies between different entities which you create separately from each other, but you want to communicate with each other, like exchange variables or something. Um, and also, the thing 
if you hadn't touched on, which I really like, if you're building um, parallel things, is you can actually use simple arithmetic in Terraform. So you can, you can use what, sorry? Simple arithmetic. You can do like loops, and you can say, I'd like 10 of these servers, and you change the variable, and you can create six. So you have this sort of, sort of a variable definition file to begin with, and then you have all these separate server definitions, and you can just say in the variable definition file, I'd like six of these servers and five of these, or the next time you run it, four and three, or whatever you want. Yeah. I really like that function of, of Terraform. I really like it too. And I totally forgot to mention it, Epic Fail. Epic Fail, because it's also one of the, it is, it is a really neat feature. What you said is spot on. If you want to deploy this cluster of, right, the, the, I think that the typical nowadays uh, example for DevOps people is having a load balancer, test server behind it, replicas, external replication, blah, 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 blah. You don't have to define 10 different resources. You just tell Terraform, I want this resource 10 times, and boom, it will, it will do it. With all these variable interpolation, interpolation that I showed you guys before. Yeah, here we have yeah, an email count, right? Count, yeah. Yeah, count, here. So, for Amazon instances, I count, let's say that here it doesn't say this bar or whatever, but I say 100 then it, it will create a hundred Amazon instances for you and then you don't, yeah, you, you don't have to care about that. Credit card. <laughs> so, somebody could come up with like a very crazy idea in which you have a system, a herder that is, that is uh, current your API to see what is the current status of the cluster and see if you have like a high peak a certain amount of time. Then you can generate a Terraform plan and to, to say, okay, right now we have 50 instances, we need a hundred more. So, then you can generate this, right? Or you can you can also generate a JSON file. You can generate a a plan which is in JSON format, pass it to Terraform, and Terraform will take care of the rest for you. So somebody could, could do something like that. Maybe somebody's doing it already. We don't know. I don't know. But anybody else? Yeah. Uh, the Belgian one with a cap. <laughs> the Belgian one without a cap. Um. Could I well? My job deals primarily with shared hosting accounts. So, sorry, <laughs> but could Terraform uh, theoretically also be used to manage uh, my application on shared hosting accounts? If I should write a module for it or something like that? What is it that you want to manage again? Exactly. What is it that you exactly want to manage? A web applications such as CMSs, as Drupal, WordPress, uh, or PHP applications. Or even smaller Ruby applications that might be hosted on sharing accounts? I think that you can, but I, but I think that you should not. Because <laughs> I don't think that Terraform is the right, is, well, hold on a second. Hold. What, what are you using to run these applications? What kind of server are you? So most of the time it's just uh, Apache servers. Uh, so it's just a MySQL database. And then either we just PHP or? The uh, answer is Yang. Yeah. Yes, you can, and no, you can. And you can. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I think, it, I think the question is mainly because you have a shared account, but you have multiple application stacks within that one account. Right? Yes, or even just print. I'm, I'm freelancer. I'm freelancer. So all my clients are not necessarily at the same hosting company. But uh, one of my requirements is, of course, that they provide these same access and, and whatnot, so I don't have to go through FTP. Or, if you have an account, or if you have access to the API uh, of one of these clouds, even if the account is a shared account, you will only manage the resources you deploy yourself. So you can have five separate Terraform configs, which all that will then have five separate state files. So you can manage one application stack with one. It's not. I agree that it's, it's better to the broader you, you manage it, the better. But the only use case is when one application stack is managed by one config together with one state file. That can be totally separated from what other people are doing with the same account. Right. Yeah, so it can be done. 